In this episode of Idea City, I spotted this rusty ladder coming down the road. I could see three policemen. It's trying to be subtle, but they stopped. And the uh, driver leaned out and said, Stop! So I stopped and said, Where are you going? I'm like, Moscow. And at this point, I was cycling on my own. Moscow is still 8,000 kilometers away. And he just started laughing. He was laughing and laughing and laughing. And his buddy beside him were laughing their heads off. You don't drive your car to Moscow, never mind your bike. I'm really excited to be here at Idea City this year. When people first hear about this part of our expedition, the question they ask isn't, well, what was it like to survive the hurricanes, or how did you deal with all that boredom, but how did you survive without killing each other? <laughs> and fair enough, uh, being on a rowboat for five months is unlike anything you'd experience in your daily lives. <laughs> First of all, it is a very small boat. It has a very small cabin. It's about the size of your average kitchen table. So imagine crawling under your kitchen table with your spouse or your best friend or someone from work and not getting out for five months. There might be a few things about that person that begin to annoy you. Well, we are no different and there's a few things about Colin. Um, and there's one thing in particular. And you see, that's, he likes to sing. <laughs> My baby and me alone on the sea. Yeah. <laughs> and now, that might not seem that bad, but he has a very limited musical repertoire. He has three favorites. There's Row, Row, Row Your Boat. There's a sea shanty where the boat sinks and everyone dies. And, well, you've heard his favorite. My baby and me alone on the sea. So imagine this, hour after hour, day after day, week after week, month after month. My baby. <laughs> so one day, about halfway across the Atlantic, we took a break to go swimming. We would do that every day when the weather allowed. And we were always a little worried about sharks. So one person would be on the boat, be on shark watch, and while well, the other went swimming. So I was on the boat, Colin was in the water. And this was a very precious time for me because this was the only time of the day where I was alone on the boat and I had silence and peace. But not today. The only thing I could hear in my head was, my baby and me alone on the sea. So that was it. I had had it. So I looked at Colin swimming so merrily and there wasn't a shark in the water, but at the top of my lungs I yelled, SHARK! <laughs> and, well, you have never seen anyone move so fast. So he may not be a champion karaoke singer, but for those 30 seconds, he was a world-class swimmer. <laughs> Apparently I'm a bad singer. Really? Huh? Yeah. But in the middle of the ocean, what's she gonna do, leave? <laughs> And you see what I had to put up with on a daily basis on those expeditions. <laughs> and, uh, you know, when people first see me, they're, um, they're often a little disappointed. Especially if they've heard of the different expeditions, you know, rowing wild rivers, or getting shot at by gorillas, climbing mountains. You know, they kind of expect me to be, well, bigger. Kind of meaner looking. I can cross between Arnold Schwarzenegger and Clint, Clint Eastwood, you know, staring off into the distance, six foot six, belt of steel. Instead, it's just little old me. And uh, there was a reporter from the province newspaper, it's a newspaper from Vancouver, who I think was kind of thinking along those lines. He wanted to do a story on our adventures. He phoned me up and said, hey, let's get an uh, interview. So the following day, he came to my house, knocked on the door. I answered, I was looking over my shoulders, when, uh, I'm looking for Colin Angus. That's me. So we did the interview. And um, the following day, the story came out. I'm just going to show you a little snippet from that article. Angus, hailed as one of Canada's great adventurers, is also one of his greatest nerds. <laughs> Angus, who stands a pale inch or two under six feet, weighs a sparse 165 pounds, looks more like a computer addled cavefish than a piranha busting daredevil. <laughs> People may be kind of disappointed to see that, offended, but you know, I, I love it. It speaks to the fact you don't need to be somebody extraordinary to go out and do crazy or wild or different things. You just need to have an idea, a concept, 
and hang on to it. Have the belief in yourself that you can do it. It was my birthday, so I called my father on the satellite phone to let him know that everything was okay, and uh, he sounded frantic as soon as he picked up the phone. He's like, Julie, things are not okay. A hurricane has formed on the ocean. It's right where you are. It's coming towards you. And I thought, I looked around. It didn't really look that stormy. And I said, no, Dad, you know, you must be mistaken. But just to be sure, I called the National Hurricane Center in Florida. Now, these are the guys that monitor the hurricanes. They track it. They know what's going on. So I rang them up, and they said, oh, yes, yes, a hurricane's formed. It's in an area thought to be too cold for hurricanes to form. It's the most northern, most eastern hurricane in all of history. And yes, it was coming straight towards us. Great. By this time, we're all alone on the ocean. We don't know if we're going to survive. We don't know. Nobody else has gone through a hurricane in a, in a rowboat before. These are storms that have a power to flatten a city. And here we are in our own little plywood boat. And the weather started to change. First it was eerily calm. And then we had, saw these strange cloud formations. And then the waves started to build. And at first it was just this huge swell, the ocean would lift our boat and gently lower it, and you knew that there was a monster storm. You know, the waves grew from 10 feet to 20 to 30, up to 50 feet. So these are waves that are as high as a five-story building, and they are smashing against our boat. And we're just careening around like a bottle with a cork in it. And our boat is supposed to be unsinkable. It's supposed to be able to capsize and right itself. But let me tell you, when you're in that boat and you're being shaken around, you're not so sure anymore. Probably wondering why we had pantyhose in the boat. <laughs> it's not Friday nights. <laughs> what else was I going to wear? <laughs> so, uh, yeah, it seems like we're always talking about the times we almost died, or the monotony, or the toil, or this and that. But, uh, of course, the reality is that's not why we're out there. We're out there to explore. And experience all these different places, meet people in different parts of the world, see these beautiful landscapes. And of course, the uh, Atlantic Ocean is no exception. Important things is risk management. And that's not only when you're faced with death, immediate death, like if you're uh, lost in a blizzard in Siberia or a hurricane is about to hit you on your rowboat, but it's every day when the risks seem much smaller because each of those risks, they add up. So we did everything we could to minimize those risks. We wore our helmets, we wore reflective clothing, we hung our food up. And then when we reached northern BC, where there are a lot of bears, we were a little bit more concerned because we had heard a story about an incident that happened on this highway that we were about to cycle, the Cassiar Highway. A woman was driving and she had pulled off on the side of the road in the night to sleep. And uh, in the middle of the night, she heard this tap, tap, tapping against her window. And uh, she woke up, and she looked out, and she didn't see anything, and she didn't hear it again, so she went back to sleep. But in the morning, when she opened her door, she saw there was a dead cyclist there. He was lying in a pool of blood. He had been mauled by a bear in the night, and he had tried to go for help. So it was that story that was playing in our minds when we were cycling this lonely highway. And we had seen bears all throughout the day, and now it was time to camp. And we were looking for a campsite, and we had pulled off the road once, but we had heard crashing in the bushes. We got back on our bikes, and it was getting dark, and we were really looking for a place to sleep. And finally, we found the perfect bear fortress. You know, in a way, that's what risk management is all about. It's not necessarily following a predetermined plan, but it's improvising, using things that you find along the way. Moscow is still 8,000 kilometers away, and he just started laughing. He was laughing and laughing and laughing, and his buddy beside him were laughing their heads off. You don't drive your car to Moscow, never mind your bike. Finally, one of the guys goes, get in the car. Remember, my Russian isn't very good, so I'm like, okay, get in the back of the car. He must be hungry. And they pull out these jars of borscht and pilmeni and start feeding me this food, which is obviously their lunch. And so we're having a right old party. One of the guys puts a cassette in the player. It's uh, some old Russian pop. And, <laughs> and one of the guys procures this big bottle of vodka. And this is Siberia. And it's about 8.30 in the morning, but they love to drink. <laughs> vodka? I'm like, no, no, I've still got 100 kilometers to cycle. Thank you. 
didn't stop them, all three of them, including the driver, down this bottle. So we're sitting there just having a party, and they wouldn't let me go until I signed the roof of the ladder. But anyway, <laughs> it was uh, quite an experience. And that's how Russia was. That's how the world was, actually. We really, there's so many warm, friendly people. And uh, I think the most important thing that uh, I learned on this trip is that you know, it is just a matter of putting these little baby steps together. There's so many times when I wanted to quit, when Julie wanted to quit, and uh, we just kept pushing on and um, just sort of focusing on the short term. Not the overall journey, but just make it through the next day. And eventually those little steps added up and we made it to the end. And uh, I know you guys are no stranger to that philosophy. All of you have done all sorts of incredible things, built up big businesses and taken on all sorts of risks and adventures of your own. And uh, I'd like to wish you all the best of luck in your own continued journeys and expeditions and uh, enjoy the rest of your time here in Whistler. Thank you. Thank you.